5.1 1 2 Six. Seven. Point two. I think it's very interesting that human beings are the only animals which listen to music for pleasure. A lot of research has been done to find out why we listen to music, and there seem to be three main reasons. Firstly, we listen to music to make us remember important moments in the past. For example, when we met someone for the first time. Think of Humphrey Bogart in the film Casablanca saying, Darling, they're playing our song. When we hear a certain piece of music, we remember hearing it for the first time in some very special circumstances. Obviously, this music varies from person to person. Secondly, we listen to music to help us change activities. If we want to go from one activity to another, we often use music to help us make the change. For example, we might play a certain kind of music to prepare us to go out in the evening. Or we might play another kind of music to relax us when we get home from work. That's mainly why people listen to music in cars, and they often listen to one kind of music when they're going to work and another kind when they're coming home. The same is true of people on buses and trains with their iPods. The third reason why we listen to music is to intensify the emotion that we're feeling. For example, if we're feeling sad, sometimes we want to get even sadder, so we play sad music. Or we're feeling angry, and we want to intensify the anger, then we play angry music. Or, when we're planning a romantic dinner, we lay the table, we light candles, and then we think, what music would make this even more romantic? 5.3 Let's take three important human emotions. Happiness, sadness and anger. When people are happy, they speak faster and their voice is higher. When they are sad, they speak more slowly and their voice is lower. And when people are angry, they raise their voices or shout. Babies can tell whether their mother is happy or not simply by the sound of her voice, not by her words. What music does is it copies this and it produces the same emotions. So faster, higher pitched music will sound happy. Slow music with lots of falling pitches will sound sad. Loud music with irregular rhythms will sound angry. It doesn't matter how good or bad the music is, if it has these characteristics, it will make you experience this emotion. Let me give you some examples. 
for Happy, for example, the first movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. For Angry, say Mars from the Planets by Holst. And for sad, something like Albinoni's Adagio for strings. Of course, the people who exploit this most are the people who write film soundtracks. They can take a scene which visually has no emotion, and they can make the scene either scary, or calm, or happy, just by the music they write to go with it. Think of the music in the shower scene in Hitchcock's film Psycho. All you can see is a woman having a shower, but the music makes it absolutely terrifying. 5.4 1 2 Three. I'd like to thank you for tuning in this afternoon. We're coming to you on the FM Airwaves. This is Music FM. We're going to be going right through to drive time through the afternoon till 8 o'clock. Now I'm going to play you one of my favourite records this year. This is The Sound of Rock and Roll. Four. Uh-huh. Yeah, come on. With a roll of the dice, uh -huh. your money gets took. Yeah. With a whole lot of ice, your honey gets took. When I slide in the Escalade, sex capades. Come on. But you know the game, I'm the next to get paid. And I turn ghetto girls into superstars. Uh -huh. Put up in videos, we got Five. Six. Seven. Ready or not, they'll go for what you got. Grab it while it's hot. 
5.6 Ch Change Cheerful Choose K Choir Chorus Orchestra Psychologist Sh Machine Moustache 5.7 I apply lifestyle psychiatrist qualify shy try type I lyrics physical rhythm symphony typical I country Heavy. 5.8 1. He used to get up at 8, but he doesn't anymore. 2. I'm not used to sleeping until 10 in the morning. 3. She usually switches on the TV as soon as she gets home. 4. I'll never get used to living alone. 5. He's not used to playing to big audiences. 6. It took me ages to get used to having lunch at 12. 5.9 1. Most people start feeling sleepy around 11 o'clock at night. 2. They often open their mouth and yawn. 3. They go to bed and set their alarm clock. 4. They get into bed and put their head on the pillow. 5. They cover themselves up with a duvet or with sheets and blankets. 6. Soon they fall asleep. 7. Some people make a loud noise when they breathe. They snore. 8. During the night, people have dreams or nightmares. 9. If you don't hear your alarm clock in the morning, you might oversleep. 10. If you drink coffee in the evening, it might keep you awake. 11. Some people can't sleep because they suffer from insomnia. 12. These people often have to take sleeping tablets. 13. Some people have a siesta or nap after lunch. 14. A person who sleeps well sleeps like a log. 15. Someone who is tired after flying to another time zone is jet-lagged. 5.10 And finally on News Today, the amazing story of a teenager who woke up this morning and discovered that she wasn't in bed. She was lying on top of a 40-metre high crane. In the early hours of this morning, a man on his way to work was passing a building site in Dulwich, South East London, when he spotted the 15-year-old girl lying on the arm of the crane. He immediately called the police on his mobile phone. The police and fire brigade arrived on the scene at 1.30, and at first they were worried that the girl might be intending to commit suicide by throwing herself off the crane. But when a fireman climbed up the crane, he could see that the girl was asleep. The fireman realised that it could be very dangerous if the girl woke up suddenly, so he crawled along the 21-metre arm of the crane and carefully wrapped the girl in a safety harness before waking her up gently. The girl had a mobile phone with her and the fireman was able to call her parents, who came to the building site straight away. Finally, the girl was brought down from the crane on a ladder the whole rescue operation had taken two and a half hours. Her parents were waiting for her on the ground and obviously they were very relieved to see her safe and well. The question everyone wanted to know was why did the girl go to sleep on the top of a crane? Well, the answer is that she had been sleepwalking. She had walked out of her house during the night without her parents noticing and sleepwalked to the building site. There was a security guard, but he didn't see her climbing the crane because he was watching TV. 
The girl's parents told the police that this wasn't the first time that she had sleepwalked, but that she had never left the house before. 5.11 Now, I imagine some of you are finding this story a bit difficult to believe, so I've invited into the studio Professor Miller, who is an expert in sleepwalking. Professor Miller, does this story surprise you? Not at all. I have treated people who have driven cars, ridden horses, and I have one man who even tried to fly a helicopter while he was asleep. But how did this girl manage to climb a 40-metre crane? It would have been no problem for her. She would climb the crane just as easily as if she were awake. And would her eyes have been open? Yes. Sleepwalkers usually have their eyes open. That's why sometimes it's difficult to know if someone is sleepwalking or not. Is sleepwalking very common? Yes. Research shows that about 18% of the population have a tendency to sleepwalk. In fact, it's much more common in children than in teenagers or adults. And curiously, it's more common among boys than girls. Adults who sleepwalk are normally people who used to sleepwalk when they were children. Adult sleepwalking often happens after a stressful event, for example, after a road accident. People always say that you should never wake a sleepwalker up when they're walking. Is that true? No, it isn't. People used to think that it was dangerous to wake up a sleepwalker, but in fact this isn't the case. You can wake a sleepwalker up without any problem, although if you do, it is quite common for the sleepwalker to be confused, so he or she probably won't know where they are for a few moments. So if we see someone sleepwalking, should we wake them up? Yes. You should remember that another of the myths about sleepwalkers is that they cannot injure themselves while they are sleepwalking. But this isn't true. If a sleepwalker is walking around the house, they can trip or fall over a chair or even fall downstairs. The other day there was a case of a nine-year-old girl who opened her bedroom window while sleepwalking and fell ten metres to the ground. Oh. Luckily, she wasn't seriously injured. So, you see, it is definitely safer to wake a sleepwalker up. Mm. How long does sleepwalking last? It can be very brief. For example, a few minutes. The most typical cases are people getting up and getting dressed, or people going to the bathroom. But it can occasionally last much longer, maybe half an hour or even more. And what happens when sleepwalkers wake up? Do they remember the things they did while they were sleepwalking? No. A sleepwalker usually doesn't remember anything afterwards. So, for example, the girl who climbed up the crane will probably have no memory of the incident. So, is a sleepwalker responsible for his or her actions? A very good question, actually. A few years ago, a man from Canada got up in the middle of the night and drove 20 kilometres from his home to the house where his parents-in-law lived and for no apparent reason, he killed his mother-in-law. The man was charged with murder, but he was found not guilty because he had been asleep at the time he committed the crime. 5.12 Song I Don't Want to Miss a Thing Stay away just to hear you breathing. Watch your smile while you are sleeping. While you're far away and dreaming, I could spend my life in this sweet surrender. I could stay lost in this moment forever.
13. Accuse. Admit. Advise. Agree. Convince. Deny. Insist. Invite. Offer. Persuade. Promise. Refuse. Regret. Remind. Suggest. Threaten. 5.14 1. Don't forget to do it. 2. I didn't do it. 3. You did it. 4. I wish I hadn't done it. 5. I'll do it, believe me. 6. Let's do it. 7. No, I won't do it. 8. OK, I'll do it. 9. I think you should do it. 10. Would you like to do it? 11. Yes, it was me. I did it. Twelve. You sit down. I'll do it. 5.15 The best thing about my job is that I get to go to the best restaurants in England, and sometimes abroad, and I don't get a bill at the end of the evening. I get the chance to eat the most wonderful, exquisite food in restaurants that I wouldn't normally be able to afford. And I can order the most expensive dishes and wines without worrying about what it's costing me. 
the other great side of the job is that I can take a friend with me. So it's a good way of catching up with old friends who I may not have seen for a while. And everyone loves a free meal in a posh restaurant, so I rarely have to eat on my own. Uh, the downside? Ooh, well, there are several. I often have to eat a lot when I'm not really hungry. To do my job properly, I have to try all the courses. You know, starter, main course, dessert. And sometimes I don't feel like eating so much, but I have to do it. I also have a problem with my weight now. It's very easy to put on weight when you eat out several times a week. In fact, most restaurant critics have a weight problem. Uh, another problem is that if I write a bad review of a meal I have, it's difficult for me to ever go to that restaurant again, because the owner of the restaurant will probably recognise me. Another disadvantage of the job is that, because I do it so often, eating out has lost a lot of its attraction for me. When the weekend comes, I prefer to eat at home rather than go out for a meal. 5.16 Nearly all foreign correspondents and war reporters that I've met are people who were looking for adventure. They're not the kind of people who would be happy with a 9 to 5 job. They are people who got into the job precisely because it has very weird hours and involves going to difficult places. I mean, to some extent, the things which are difficult and potentially dangerous about the job are also the things that made you want to do the job in the first place and the reason why the job is so exciting. Something else I really like about the job is that I work as part of a team. You sit down and have dinner together at the end of the day and talk things through with other journalists and photographers and... You are talking to people who have experienced the same things as you and seen the same things as you, and that's very important in this kind of work. One of the problems of the job is seeing a lot of horrific things and then going back home to normality. I remember a few years ago coming back from a war zone where I had been for a long time and I'd seen a lot of death and destruction and I went to a friend's wedding in London. It was a beautiful day, everyone was drinking champagne and talking about unimportant things, and I wanted to say, why can't you see that there is something awful happening in the world? Another major worry about my job these days is the risk of being killed. Journalists used to get killed by accident, but now there are more and more cases of journalists being killed simply because they are journalists, and they are also becoming the target of kidnappers. Two of my colleagues have been kidnapped recently, and a very good friend of mine was killed last year. 5.17 Part 1 Sir Nicholas Kenyon was the director of a festival of concerts called The Proms for 12 years. How did The Proms start? The Promenade Concerts started way back in 1895 when a brilliant impresario wanted to use a newly built concert hall in London, the Queen's Hall, for a series of popular concerts that really brought classical music to the widest possible audience. Uh, there were important classical concerts during the year, but in the summer people tended to go away, society life finished, and so he had the brilliant idea of taking away all the seats on the floor of the hall where the expensive people usually sat and letting people come in and stand there and walk around and have a very informal experience of, of concert going. The name proms is an abbreviation of promenade concerts and it basically means that people are able to walk around uh, and stand during the music. How long did the proms last? The proms lasts for two months in the summer, from the middle of July to the middle of September. And during that period, there's one concert every day, two concerts on many days, three concerts on, on some days. So it's a very, very intense period of music making. And people buy season tickets in order to be able to attend all the concerts, whether they do or, or not. Very few people attend actually all of them, except me. Uh, and they come and they queue during the day in order to get the best places in the floor of the hall where they stand. World-class musicians perform at the proms for much lower fees than they would expect to receive. Why do you think that is? I think the proms has an absolutely unique atmosphere. That's what orchestras and conductors who come here say. Um, and so people do want 
to come and perform. What you get at the proms is a wonderful mixture of total informality and total concentration. So that although people don't dress up to come to the proms, they behave how they want, they actually absolutely listen to the music. And that is a feature that so many conductors and orchestras really comment on. The level of concentration is absolutely amazing. 5.18, part two. There must have been many truly memorable concerts during your time as director of the proms. Could you tell us about one of them? Uh, the death of Princess Diana was particularly difficult because, of course, uh, she lived just across the road in Kensington Palace from where the proms happen in the Royal Albert Hall. We changed some programmes to make them more appropriate. On the day of her funeral, we put in Foray's Requiem to the programme. Very oddly, we had programmed uh, two or three requiems in that last two weeks of the season and they fitted very very well we then lost uh, another major figure of the musical world the conductor sir george Schulte, who was to have conducted the verdi requiem on the last friday of the season and he was in he had been a very good friend of princess diana and indeed had rung me up just after diana's death to say that he wanted to dedicate this Verdi Requiem to her memory. As it turned out, he died just a week later, and so another conductor, Colin Davis, took over that Verdi Requiem and dedicated it to both of them. And it was a fantastically charged atmosphere in the hall. I can't remember such an electric occasion as that. I understand there was also another spooky coincidence in the programme at the time of Diana's death. Could you tell us about it? A wonderful American composer called John Adams had written an absolutely wonderful piece which we were going to do on the last night of the proms in 1997. Unfortunately, I mean, it could have been called absolutely anything, this piece. It's a whirling, abstract piece of fanfare music. Unfortunately, he had called it Short Ride in a Fast Machine. And so it was perfectly obvious from the first moment that we had to take that, pro that piece out uh, and change the programme. Are there any embarrassing or amusing experiences you remember? Well, one of the things that was a real challenge to the proms was the arrival of the mobile phone. Uh, because in the beginning, people didn't know how to use them, when to switch them off. Um, uh, and the Albert Hall is a very, very big space and mobile phones would go off in concerts and, and it could be very embarrassing. Usually, because they were in the middle of the music, conductors just ignored them and people got embarrassed and switched them off. But there was one particular incident that was just so awful uh, because Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring starts with a very, very exposed, quiet, bassoon solo. And Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic, making one of their first appearances together at the proms, had just begun that piece when a mobile phone went off very loudly in the stalls. And Simon Rattle uh, stopped the bassoonist and turned round and glared at this person in the stalls and <clears throat> there was a round of applause and everything so anyway that it restarted and the performance was a spectacular success and it was wonderful but this was such a an incident that he had actually stopped it that it became the subject of a lot of media attention and there were paragraphs in the papers and i had to go and be interviewed the next day um, at home for a Radio 4 programme about mobile phones going off in concerts. And in the middle of this interview, my own phone went off. And it's a, very, it's a wonderfully classic little bit of tape. Uh, my embarrassment at the same thing happening to me. 5.19. One. The Promenade concert started way back in 1895. It basically means that people are able to walk around uh, and stand during the music. Three. Very few people attend, actually all of them, except me. Four. Very oddly, we had programmed uh, two or three requiems in that last two weeks of the season. Five. As it turned out, he died just a week later. Six. Unfortunately, 
I mean, it could have been called absolutely anything. 5.20. One, Anne. Have you ever been to a music festival? Yes. Uh, Isle of Wight in the 70s. What was it like? There were just thousands and thousands of people just chilling out, doing whatever you wanted to do, um, and it was just great fun. There was music, dancing, um, a, gr a great memory, actually. Two, Jordan. Have you ever been to a music festival? Yes. Which ones? We have a rock festival back home in Ohio that we go to. A lot of my friends and I go to. What was it like? I don't know what it's called, but it's just like a whole bunch of alternative music. It's like two days long and you all go and it's just a fun time all outside. And there's a ton of people. They're all usually younger from like college age usually. And they just have a whole bunch of stages set up. And um, there's just bars and different places and you can just go and hang out and listen to some music. Three, Mike. Have you ever been to a music festival? Yes, I went to Glastonbury. What was it like? Incredibly muddy, incredibly muddy, but great fun. Absolutely so much fun. Didn't get any sleep at all. Four, Ray. Have you ever been to a music festival? Uh, yes, not for many years. When I was much younger, I went to uh, Bath, Bath Music Blues Festival. I've been to Reading Music Festival. I've been to uh, oh, I can't remember which other ones I've been to, but yes, in the 1970s, early 80s, I went to quite a few. What was it like? <laughs> From a 57-year-old's point of view, at the time they were really excited. I, I can remember a long journey down to Bath, sleeping in a field. I can remember uh, expensive food, waiting up all night to see the band that you wanted to see and then falling asleep. Uh, I can remember being taken back to sleep in somebody's tent and then waking up and realising we were in the wrong tent, I had no idea whose tent we were in the next morning. Uh, I can remember feeling uh, slightly slightly sort of sick and hungry all the time I was there, but yeah, it was good, it was exciting. Five, Harley. Have you ever been to a music festival? No. Oh, yeah, actually, the Big Chill. I never went to the Big Chill. What was it like? Um, yeah, it was really good. We, um, I went with my dad and my sister, and uh, we went in a camper van. So we camped and, yeah, it, it was good. 5.21. One. There were just thousands and thousands of people just chilling out. Two. You can just go and hang out and listen to some music. Three. Didn't get any sleep at all. Four. In the 1970s, early 80s, I went to quite a few. Five. And I had no idea whose tent we were in the next morning. 5.22. One. The results of the test have come back from the lab and they were positive. We'll have to wait until next week for the board to decide on how long he'll be suspended, but most people are predicting that his punishment will be quite tough in order to set an example to the younger players. So we definitely won't be seeing him in competition in the near future, and he could be facing as much as a two-year ban. 2. Her nomination extends her lead as the most nominated woman in the history of the Academy Awards. Her tally now extends to 14 nominations and two wins, and if she wins again in March, that will make it three. However, she faces strong competition this year, mainly from outside the USA, in the form of... Three. After quite a chilly start to the day, tomorrow will be mild and overcast all over the country, with the chance of scattered showers, especially later in the day. Four. An overturned lorry has completely blocked the northbound carriageway of the M6. Police advise motorists to find an alternative route if at all possible. However, the M40 is now clear in both directions, and delays are likely on the railway networks due to major engineering work between Warwick and Birmingham. 5. A 45-year-old man has been charged with arson after a fire destroyed 10 acres of woodland in Yorkshire last week. Nigel Slatterly from Leeds denies the charge, and he will appear at Leeds Crown Court at the end of this month. 5.23 Why can the same sound be beautiful music for some people and for others just noise and probably unpleasant noise? Well, there are two main reasons. The first is to do with rules. Music has rules, and if you understand the rules, you enjoy the music. If you don't, for you, it is noise. It's just like a language. 
If you listen to a language you don't understand, for you it is just noise. A good example is modern classical music. Most music over the last 500 years has been tonal. That means it has tunes, harmony and so on. And those are the rules that most of us understand. But when some classical composers in the 20th century started writing atonal music, they broke the rules, and for most people, this just sounds like noise, until you learn to understand the new rules of atonal music. The same is also true of a lot of experimental jazz, where players are improvising. And the second reason? The second reason is the cultural associations that music has for us. A lot of young people, for example, associate opera or classical music with boring older people, a stuffy concert hall, music that goes on forever, so for them, it is noise. There is a shopping mall somewhere in the UK where they had a problem with a group of young people hanging around in the afternoons and evenings, so they decided to play classical music instead of playing the usual pop music. The teenagers found it so uncool that they stopped coming. And of course, for many older people, when they hear any music with a beat, they don't hear it as music, they just hear it as thump, thump, thump. And for them, it also has negative